Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. As you can see, they are taking a quick break in the courtroom. What you just heard there was direct examination on the defense's case in chief of Dr. Lawrence Miller, a psychologist. And he gave a profound statement at the end that just wrapped it up before that break. It's a powerful statement to leave the jury with to go settle in and percolate with those thoughts. He specifically said that in his professional opinion, and he was he is an expert, he was validated as an expert to testify for the defense. He said that in his professional opinion, his conclusion is, is that the defendant responded to what he perceived as a deadly threat and that his actions were there to neutralize a situation and therefore justified. Now, it's important to remember that this is a defense witness, a paid for witness by the defense. And we'll see how he handles himself in cross-examination. In the meantime, I'd like to discuss this. With me is Marnie Jo Snyder, criminal defense attorney out of Philadelphia. Marnie, you and I heard that and came onto the line at about the same time listening to that. How do you think the jury is taking his conclusions? Do they realize that this is a paid-for defense expert and possibly motivated testimony? Or do you think that they're taking it as, you know what, maybe this guy is justified in these killings? I think that... Um it, during this break, who knows what they're doing? They're not supposed to be uh, discussing the case right now. But as we wrap up, the judge is going to give them legal instructions that explains to them that they're the arbiters of the, the case and deciding uh, what facts to believe and what witnesses to believe. And they're going to have to decide uh, the same thing about an expert, that they're not made to be believed just because they're an expert, um, but that you look at uh, their testimony through that lens and decide whether or not they're credible. And they're also going to be told that they're the ones that to decide whether uh, Officer Van Dyke was reasonable. So right. we'll see what impact that has. So what do you think? I know they're not talking about it, but they're certainly on break thinking about it, right? Absolutely. They, they just, the, the defense just left the jury with a powerful, conclusory statement from an expert who said, in my professional opinion, he was there to neutralize a deadly threat. And from his perception, this was a deadly threat. And therefore, as a professional psychologist, this is justified. This killing was justified because in the line of duty, he had an affirmative duty to neutralize the threat because he must protect the public. Is, are the jurors buying it? What's your speculation? You're a criminal defense attorney. Right. What do you think it's the jurors are thinking as they take a break and roam the halls of the courthouse and go to the bathroom and get water? They're thinking. Yes, and what they're going to be thinking about is that that was really powerful um, and that an expert is telling them that that was okay. And they're also thinking probably about the danger uh, that someone with a knife could have posed to them. But they also need to be thinking about what standard they want to set for police officers in the future. Does that is that okay with them mm -hmm. when 16 bullets went into a young man who just had a knife? And right. so they're going to have to think, you know, is that is that the kind of police force that we want? Should that be reasonable to police officers? Um, and is it fair to believe that he believed he was in so much danger that that was a use of force that was justifiable? And, and so I think probably right now they're sitting with that powerful statement, um, but they're they're nervous for the next steps that they need to decide. Right. And as the next step will be cross-examination, we'll see if the prosecution asks on the stand, are you getting paid to be there? And how, what's your hourly rate and how much are you making to testify today? That's always powerful. I'd love to hear that come out and find out if that's going to come out. We're going to keep monitoring the courtroom live. We have a feed there, but we have to take a quick break. Stick with us. We will be back in just a few minutes right here on Long Crime. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. Okay, that was more testimony from the psychologist, Lawrence Miller, who's testifying for the defense uh, and Van Dyke, going to his state of mind. As you can see there, he was going into the deadly force mindset. He had it up on a PowerPoint presentation or, or a computer in front of him, which he was going through some bullet points, which we just saw on the screen. And as we just heard, he said that a lot of officers freeze or hesitate before using deadly force. Marnie, I want to ask you, because in this case, it doesn't appear that Van Dyke froze at all. I mean, within 16 seconds of getting out of that, out of that car, 16 shots were fired quite quickly out of that gun. So is this defendant, contra I mean, is this witness contradicting himself by having a conclusory statement of, in my professional opinion, 
he acted reasonably, but then just saying what we just heard about the deadly force mindset of how it's normal and reasonable to hesitate, I just caught that. Yeah, I think that what he was trying to say, and you know, this is for the lawyers to wrap up in their arguments um, or on cross-examination, is that uh, some people freeze, but that's not the reasonable response. So I think that the reason the defense called him and, and allowed him to say that and had him say that so is because they're saying that freezing is abnormal. It's reasonable to see a threat, have that fight or flight response and react to the threat. And that's that's what the jury has to decide. So he's saying that they actually freeze. They're not being thoughtful that, you know, they might be shutting it down. But that's not how everyone feels, that it's more uh, reasonable to be terribly afraid. Right. And the standard is that it's more reasonable to be on the offensive rather than to hesitate. But it, as you said, this really is left up to argument. And that's probably going to be wrapped up quite succinctly in closing arguments. We're going to continue with this testimony. And obviously, after the break, more testimony that will be live in the courtroom with this defense star expert witness. But I want to give you the opportunity to just give some insight to the viewers of how you think this witness is testifying. And is it effective testimony? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's phenomenal for the defense because this guy is saying it's totally reasonable. He was terrified um, without having or to back up what the defendant, uh, you know, would say. Um, but really, if they want to be skeptical, and I'm very skeptical of this testimony. I mean, yeah, he's afraid, right? Someone's holding a knife. He's scared. Um, he's a human being just like everyone else. But the jury's going to have to decide, do we want a police force that does make deadly use of force a last resort? Do we want one that makes it, that uses it only when it's an extreme necessity? Um, do you, or do, we, do we want people running around terrified and shooting each other? And do you think that this testimony is, a, is effective, that it's reasonable when we have dash cam video showing the, def, uh, the victim actually walking away, trying to, it looks what looks like defuse a threat, on dash cam video, how effective is a paid expert in overcoming actual video? Right. He's effective because he might be able to put into more eloquent words what the defendant wants to say about how scared he was. So the defendant says, I was very scared, and this expert says, very, very scared, and here's the biological response. But the jury is going to see him walking away and without a knife in the air, and not coming towards the defendant, even though the defendant once claimed that he lunged at him. And I think that's very powerful. Is it powerful enough to offset what this expert says? I, we'll see. Right. Don't you wish you could be a fly on the wall in that deliberation room? Absolutely. I know I always do. We are back live in the courtroom, so let's go back live into court, and then we'll be back here for more in-studio analysis. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. And as you can hear, you're listening to the Van Dyke trial. This is the case where the officer is standing trial for murder for shooting a teenage boy. The question is, was it reasonable and justified under the circumstances? Right now, the defendant is putting on his case in chief, and the psychologist, Dr. Lawrence Miller, is testifying on cross-examination that it was reasonable. With me, Marnie, you're still with me here. Thank you for joining us. I want to go over a couple key things that I just heard in cross-examination, one of which I was anticipating to hear, and that was his price to be there that day, $10,000. That's the million-dollar question. What is, it, what is your cost to be here that, to testify and give your paid-for opinion? Do you think the jury picked up on the motivation behind that? I think that they did, um, or I hope that they did, because there's some really interesting uh, other things that he said that, that kind oh, of I have to like cut you off. I just got oh, it word that we have to go, I think, back to court. We'll be back on that question. Okay. You know that's a violation of the decorum order? No, I did not. You did not. Who is sitting next to you? Who's that? Get that individual up there. Before I ask him if he was sitting next to you when the decorum order was read, I want you to think about your answer. All right? Did you see here my deputy read the court order in this court? Yes. All right. Thank you for pulling All right, take him into custody. I find you in direct contempt of court. Okay. 
Wow. Okay, Marnie, let's talk about what just happened there. So someone was sitting in court and it appears was recording in court and the judge is holding him in direct contempt of court. This seems to be a theme in cases that we're covering here on Long Crime on the network of people in the courtroom being held in court in, in contempt of court. What do you think is going to happen to this guy? Uh, the judge is going to set a time for sentencing to determine what the penalty is. But he can take him into custody for now as he determines that since he made a finding of contempt. Um, so I don't I, I don't know. I mean, the judge might just want to make sure that everyone knows that he means business and this gentleman might get out at the end of the day. We don't know. But recording people in court is very serious because it can seem like intimidation. Uh, you know, the the some people in the press or students think that it's a good shortcut for taking notes. Um, but the, the courts take it very seriously because they're trying to avoid intimidation and the release of information uh, for potential jurors to hear. Never a dull moment when you're watching uh, live TV. So I want to go back to that question, and we're going to keep an eye on the courtroom while you continue to answer the question. I'll remind you of what it is, um, but we're going to keep an eye on the courtroom. If anything else exciting happens, I'm going to cut you off again, and we're going to go back to court. So the question was, um, at, right at the beginning of cross-examination, the attorney, in my opinion, effectively asked, what is it char What are you getting paid for to be here today? What's right. your cost? And it was $10,000. The million-dollar question is $10,000 and an answer. I wanted your opinion and your expert advice on whether or not that was effective for the jurors to understand that this could be biased testimony, biased paid for expert testimony, rather than something that they should just take at face value. Or do you think the jurors need to hear this in closing argument as argument for the attorneys to piece it together and say, hey, that's a defense expert. He's paid for, and you heard him say he charges $10,000 to be here today. Right. And, and I think it is a little bit of both, right? 10000 is a big number um, for people who are looking at a police officer. You know, they're thinking about what a police officer makes as income and what's being used to defend them, and does that seem fair to them? Then they're going to be thinking about whether this guy can be paid off to give this opinion. And then third, they're going to be thinking about what is really the value of what he said in comparison to that 10000 that he got paid. How important and crucial is this testimony, or is it something to distract us and the defense can literally pay their way out of having to answer in this case? Right. All good points. We're going to go back live into the courtroom because we have more for you there, and then we'll be back here with more in-studio analysis. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. That's a live feed into the Van Dyke trial. And Lawrence Miller is still on the stand, sustaining cross-examination. A couple of key things to take away so far. First one is there's no test of what's going through someone's mind. It's all perception. And he admitted that there's no psychometric test. It's up to interpretation. And then he says hindsight's always 20-20. Marnie, I heard you grumble something in my <laughs> ear when you heard that come through. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to uh, utter that grumble a little bit more eloquently on the air. Right. Well, he, I, I was a little confused there because what the expert was saying is that he used an interview with uh, Jason Van Dyke to assess what his perceptions would have been at the time. And then he's there to kind of talk about how those perceptions would show some sort of fear um, uh, that would justify the deadly force. But then he says, well, yeah, now we know what happened. So it, it's a little bit strange because he was taking Jason Van Dyke's word for many things. And so that's what the prosecution is doing now. He locked the um, witness in to all the reasons that he believes that his conclusion is correct. And now the prosecutor is trying to destroy them one by one. The one that we saw was that um, the prosecution alleges that Jason Van Dyke never heard on any 911 call or radio call over the over the police radio that the tires were punctured. So how could that have factored into the shooting when he knew right. those letters? And then we also heard some, so you're implying that he's lying, and then there was an objection to that, yes. to that conclusory uh, perception, which was interesting. We do have to go to a quick break, but I wanted to ask you real fast, do you like the style, yes or no, of this attorney? Um, I, in the beginning, go to break. Was, yes or no, we got to go. It was, uh, yeah, I like it so far. Okay, gotta, we better. got to be back after this moment. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. We are live in the Van Dyke trial. And right now the defense is putting on their case in chief. And that was a defense expert, Dr. Lawrence Miller. And 
We had quite a bit of testimony. First, it was direct examination, then cross-examination, then redirect, and then recross. And what you just heard was not a high point for a recross, which the prosecution just left the jurors, I think, with an interesting taste in their mouth. The judge said to the attorney, stop the editorial process and rephrase the question. That's like shame on you, counselor. And then the attorney got a little bit fumbled up and then had no further questions. Now, attorneys are talking to the judge and we'll keep you posted there. But with me, Marnie, I want to give you an opportunity to discuss that and then we're going to go to a new witness on the stand real fast. What kind of uh, taste in the mouth did you feel that that was left with, with uh, that kind of last question with a fumble? It wasn't a great one. Um, and the redirect from the defense side went pretty well too. Uh, they let the doctor say, I don't think he's lying. Um, in, you know, in my opinion, based on consistency and all that stuff. And that's normally what the jury is supposed to decide. So they really did a good job on redirect and recross. I mean, he got out that the doctor was saying that under stress, um, Jason Van Dyke said that he saw things in, in, incorrectly. Right. Um, but that's about the main point he got to make before he fumbled. Well, it'll all be up to the jury. We have a new witness on the stands. It's Detective William Johnson. He's with the Chicago Police Department. We're going to go live into the courtroom, and then we'll be back here. I'm Carissa Kranz, and we are covering many things here on the network, gavel to gavel. Right now, the Van Dyke trial is our main trial. They just took a quick break, right as we took a break. But now that we're back on break, I want to bring Marnie back on to help discuss and give us some final thoughts before we switch gears into some other cases we're covering here on the network. What are your thoughts, final thoughts, as the defense is putting on their case? The defense hasn't rested. We don't even know if the defendant himself will take the stand yet. But what are your final thoughts so far on what we've heard today and how it's going? I think the expert was really powerful for the defense, and it's going to be the prosecution's job to explain um, why that doesn't need to make the case for the defense. Um, so it was very interesting. If the prosecution can appropriately show the contradictions that the defense expert makes, then they might still be on really strong ground. So they're saying that the experts saying that the police are specifically trained to control their behavior. They're specifically trained to observe. They make cases out against people all over this country all the time in courtrooms. But then he also says, well, this officer was under so much stress that he even perceived things incorrectly. So much stress, the prosecution will say, from not hearing about punctured tires, from having a weapon and not dropping it, and from a dead stare but not raising the knife. So that's where the debate is going to be, is which standard do we want to hold uh, Officer Van Dyke to? What standard are we going to be holding police to across this country? And how much are we going to let psychologists tell the jury uh, how to feel about that? Okay. All good points, all things to consider. Who knows how the jury's taking it. Speaking of jurors, let's switch gears to another trial we've been covering very closely on the network. It was the Jessica Chambers case. The defendant, Quentin Tellis, had his retrial, and it was a mistrial, a hung jury. Let's take a look at that verdict and discuss this for a minute. Ms. Moore, I've got a note from you all that uh, looks like... Uh... Y'all don't feel like y'all are going to be able to reach a decision in this case. Is that the, is that the uh, uh, feeling of the jury? Yes, Members of the jury, is that, uh, is that you, you, feel, you agree with Ms. Marr? Yes, sir. And is there anyone that does not agree with that? So, all right, so uh, uh, you've uh, worked very hard, uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, you know, uh, Twelve hours is a long time to deliberate. Uh, really, you've almost say you've been in deliberation for 24 hours. But, uh, and I wish that uh, you'd been able to reach a verdict. I think you wish you'd been able to reach a verdict. Uh, I know you've been very attentive to the evidence. I know you've taken your job seriously. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz, and that was the judge reading the verdict in the Jessica Chambers trial. Remember, this is the case where Jessica Chambers was lit on fire, had a horrific death. 
We covered this over the weekend. It was a marathon weekend here at Long Crime. There she is. She was a cheerleader in Mississippi, and she was burned alive. It came down to whether or not what she uttered as she was dying in her dying breaths could have been audible or not, whether there was enough evidence or not. Quentin Tellis got a second hung jury a mistrial. Marnie, what does this mean now? Is this a win for the defense team? What now? I mean, this is a story that has gripped the nation. Our ratings here, our viewership here skyrocketed on this trial. Everyone wants to know what now. I think it, it is a win for the defense uh, in a lot of ways. One is because he is not a uh, convicted murderer at this point. So it's the obvious win. Uh, usually retrials don't get a lot better for the defense because any surprise moves or arguments that the prosecution hasn't contemplated can now be used at the next trial. Um, but I think in this one, really the prosecution put even more on the table and the defense was still able to have people hold out. So I think it's a really big win for the press, for the defense. And it's my understanding that the jury was split almost down the middle uh, when the judge declared a mistrial. So that's also a, a big win for them. So what do you think now is going to happen? Do you think the prosecution is going to retry the case? Do you think they're going to try to ha strike a plea deal? What now? I mean, this is a it's high media profile case. I can't imagine them saying, you know what, let's just sign off on this one. I mean, there's an oxygen series about it. This <laughs> has gotten a lot of media attention. It's hard to just, um, it's hard to make it go away. Yeah, I think that, well, I believe that what they're saying is that they're going to wait to decide whether to do a retrial based on what Louisiana does, um, because Mr. Charles is uh, accused of another murder there. Right. And so they're going to pass the buck for now. Right. Um, and when I say buck, I really do mean money. I mean, these trials are expensive. Yep. Having a sequestered jury is expensive. So uh, they're going to see the outcome of that case. Right. If he gets a life sentence in that case, they might decide not to retry it. At well, this right. Point. There's no point if he'll just do right. a. They can do a plea and run it with the other, right. with the other sentence concurrently. So let's take a look at some of the defense closing arguments. Since, in a way, like you said, this is a defense win uh, because he's not a convicted murderer. Let's take a look at what defense say in closing arguments. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. That is prosecution's closing arguments in the Jessica Chambers trial. As you know, and we reported here on the network as soon as it broke, this was a hung jury, another mistrial. We just played for you a little bit of the defense closing arguments and now some of the prosecution's closing arguments. I can understand why the jurors were split because the defense closing argument to me was a better closing argument. It said it stuck to the facts, not medical evidence, which the defense pointed out is not absolute, not to phone records, which everyone can agree the defendant, Quentin Tellis, is a liar because he's been inconsistent, but that doesn't make him a murderer. Marnie, I want to discuss this with you before we go to a break and give you the opportunity to give some insight and legal analysis and feedback. But from what I hear, the defense is saying, look, these are the facts. We had nine first responders who came and they all said the same thing. She walked and she talked. And while the prosecution can call an expert, medical experts, and they can qualify them and they can pay them, that is not absolute evidence. And that does not negate the nine people that heard her and saw her walk and talk. Also, let's not forget the jurors were taken to the scene with it being recreated and got to listen and hear for themselves whether or not that was possible. What are your thoughts on this, uh, these closing arguments, the verdict, and the entire situation? It was a lot easier uh, for the defense to say all those things with confidence because they did have those nine people that said, this is what I heard. It's reasonable they were doubt. unwavering. It's reasonable doubt. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 what they stuck with in the trial is that in her phone, his name was not there. There was no name. So maybe to her, his name was Eric. But that's reasonable doubt. Every time I was a I was a prosecutor, every time I picked a jury, everyone would say they would much rather let a guilty man walk than put an innocent man behind bars. And I think those jurors went back there in the deliberation room and they said, I don't know if this man is guilty. He's not a good guy, but I don't know if he committed this murder, as awful as it is, and as much as someone should be held accountable. I agree with you, and I think that's probably how they were split, because what I saw the prosecutor close on is he's a liar. 
We know they were together and he lied about things. And so if he didn't do it, why would he lie? And he was in proximity to her. I mean, the, the reason that the nine people saying she said Eric is because she was the identifying witness. And that is powerful. The prosecution didn't have any re other reason that they pointed to Quinton other than he lied. And we know he was near her that day. And so I think that the people that split kind of, it was just agreement. Six people agreed with the prosecution. Six people agreed with the defense. And I don't think that there's any secret reasons that we would need to be flies on the wall in the jury room in this particular case, uh, because it seems that that's that you you got it exactly right. That those six people just said, I have a reasonable doubt. She said, Eric, that's the end of it. Right. The nine people, first responders heard right. it. And really, there's no be better evidence than that which happened that day who showed up on scene while she was still alive. And they heard her say her name. They heard her say Chambers instead of Chambers, but she talked and she walked. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back on this network with more trials and analysis. Stick with us. Welcome back, I'm Carissa Kranz. That is actually some key testimony we just heard in the Jessica Chambers trial. We just heard the, the, the one of the first responders say that she was extremely breathy and full of air and he heard Eric and Derek, which was key and he was asking her questions because he believed he was never gonna see her again after that day and he was trying to get as much information as possible to lend towards the investigation. Marnie, I wanna talk to you um, about this real fast. Um, you know. Lots of times people are murdered and die, and first responders don't get an opportunity of final moments with the victim. This case is really special because not only is it a horrific, horrific crime, I mean, there are crimes and then there are like crime of crimes, um, but you have first responders that like got information and got to interview the victim in her final breaths. That's powerful. It's very powerful, and the law recognizes that it's powerful. I mean, there's a reason that that's allowed into evidence, even though people can't question the deceased about that. Um, and it's because when someone is on the verge of death, they're unlikely to lie, because there would be no consequences for coming out and telling the truth. Um, they're likely to feel like it's their final moment, and they want to get information to the people that can bring them justice. And so it's really powerful. It's right. an important statement. So it just comes down to whether or not it's medically possible. We have to go to a quick break. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz, and we have a jam-packed schedule here on the network. We have trials out of Illinois. We have trials out of Texas. We have verdicts in Jessica Chambers. We are busy and full of information. With me is Marnie, and I want to talk to her before she's got to wrap up with us for the day, because I know it's 2 p.m., and Marnie, I know you said you have to go around 2 p.m. and do your day job, which is being a lawyer. Do you have any, we're coming back to trial in um, Van Dyke. We have a live feed right now. The jurors are back. We're, we're keeping a close watch on the courtroom there. The, the guy that earlier today when we were on is actually just being talked to by the judge who was taken into custody and now he's being held in contempt of court for videoing in the courtroom. Do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, that, we, before the break, we, we had a, Oh, we got to go to court. Van Dyke is taking the stand. Maybe you could stick with us a few minutes. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. Van Dyke himself is taking the stand in his own defense. And as you can see, the judge just called the attorneys for a sidebar. Marnie, why do you think the judge wants to talk to the attorneys? What's going on? This might just be a scheduling sidebar. Um, not, not as far as when to take a bathroom break, but a scheduling sidebar saying, how much of his background are we going to get into and how long is that going to take? And that's because, you know, the, the decedent's not there to speak for himself and his family only got a certain amount of time to introduce who he is. So I think going through this gentleman's career month by month might be what the judge considers a, a waste of time here, that they should, you know, explain his career in more general terms, more resume terms and start to move on to that night or at least something more recent. Well, as a form of strategy, I would assume that the defendant is trying, or the defense is trying to use as much time as possible to allow the jurors to get to know him and humanize him, because Absolutely. that's going to be a more effective 
um, defense tactic because God knows what's going to happen under cross-examination. Uh, do you think in this case it's a good idea for him to take the stand? You're a criminal defense attorney. Would you have put him on the stand? Um, I think in this kind of case, it's hard not to. Uh, I, I think that sometimes you want to let the prosecution have to meet their burden without saying anything. Um, but here, I know they want to hear from him. They want to hear how scared he really was that night so that the expert's testimony is even more powerful. Um, you know, they complement one another. And I think it kind of looks silly to have the expert say it and not have Jason Van Dyke say it. Right. And as everyone knows, the defendant does not have to take the stand at all. The defendant has nothing to prove. The prosecution has the burden to prove the case beyond any and all reasonable doubt. But it's no secret that on some human level, jurors want to hear from the defendant. And it just implies, even though it, it can't legally, it just implies that why don't you want to talk to us? We want to hear from you. What's your side of the story? We've heard from experts. We've heard from lawyers. We've heard from the other side. We've heard from witnesses. What's your side of the story? You can't help but be human and wanting to hear from the defendant, right? Absolutely. And you have to be really careful about when to put a defendant on. Um, and it depends on the type of case. But I think at all times, I know that to some point, the jury is going to question why my client didn't speak to them, exactly. whether they hold it against them, you know, towards finding them guilty is a totally different story, but they want to know. You know, and I also would assume that in a case like this, where you have an officer, a professional, while he may or may not have acted reasonably under the circumstances, that's to be determined right. by the trier of fact, the jurors. It's, you know, either way, you know that you have a professional who knows how to present, who knows how to show up for work, who knows how to and has been trained to think and work methodically. And while he may have messed up under these circumstances, more likely than not, he's a reliable witness and will present well for a jury and only help his case. That's what I would think if he was my client and I was going to and I was trying the case for him. Yeah, it'd be very strange if he testified in all these other people's court cases for the last 15 years and then was too nervous to take the stand on his, point. in his own. That's a very good point. Officers all the time testify in court as witness, uh, expert witnesses, first responders. They talk about what happened. And it would be very weird from the perspective of the jurors of why he doesn't want to take his own defense if they put that together. Because as the law says... Uh, you know, no, you do not have to self-incriminate yourself. He has no obligation to take the stand. He is willingly taking the stand in his own defense. Those are pictures of him on the screen. This is the case, um, the Van Dyke trial, where the officer is standing trial for the alleged murder of a teenager of what happened, white officer, black kid. He arrived on scene and within a matter of 16 seconds unloaded an entire barrel of gun and with, unfortunately, um, Laquan McDonald died. The question is whether or not this is reasonable, not whether, and justified under the circumstances, not whether or not he did it, not whether or not it's right or wrong. It's clearly wrong. He clearly killed someone, but does it rise to the level of murder? We still have a live feed in the courtroom. As you can see, we have some action in the courtroom, but I just got word from the control room that they are going on recess. So I know you need to go as well, Marnie. So before I let you go, do you have any final thoughts on the Van Dyke trial before we're going to continue monitoring this on the network? The defense is going to continue putting on its case. I would assume after the defendant takes a stand, they're probably going to rest their case, and then we're going to go into closing arguments. Do you have any final thoughts for our viewers on this trial? Um, pay very close attention to what happens next and stay tuned, because I can't imagine how this cross is going to go. He's going to get destroyed at some points rehabilitated at others, and we're finally going to get to hear what he says he was perceiving that evening. All right. Thanks, Marnie. Always a pleasure to have you on the network. We're going to go to a quick break here on the network while the trial also goes to a break. So stick with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes.